now. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Bitman Culture Diagnostics, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar under the name of Diagnostics Confidence with AMH Testing. My name is Ahmed Shahata. I'm the Product Manager for Clinical Chemistry and Immunoassays in Bitman Coulter, Middle East and Africa. I will be moderating today's session along with our speaker, Dr. Matilda Toglo. Please feel free to post your question at any time on the Q&A section. And you will be always finding a link to the web page of the assay latest uh, brochure where you can find more information about the test. By the end of this session, you will get a short survey. Please try to fill it when you have time in order for us to improve our best practice for the future. Thank you very much for attending. And Dr. Matilda, please feel free to start. Thank you, Ahmed. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Matilda Merve Toglu. I am medical doctor with pharmacology PhD, and uh, I have the title as scientific marketing manager at Beckman Coulter. It is my honor today to be here and give a presentation on the diagnostic confidence with AMH testing uh, and insights into clinical utility. As we all know, uh, during this presentation, firstly, I will cover topics that uh, will answer questions such as what is the physiological role of AMH? What is the relationship between AMH and ovarian reserve? How do clinicians use uh, AMH testing in fertility clinics and uh, in vitro fertilization procedures? And last but not at least, why should healthcare professionals choose the automated access AMH assay to measure AMH levels? Uh, firstly, I would like to start with the biology and physiology of AMH testing. As we all know, the menstruation is the cyclic, orderly laughing of the uterine lining in response to the interactions of hormones produced by the hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovaries. The menstrual cycle may be divided in two phases. The first phase of the menstrual cycle is the follicular or proliferative phase. It occurs from day zero to day 14 of the menstrual cycle based on the average duration of uh, 28 days. The variability in the menstrual cycle length occurs due to the variations in the length of the follicular phase. The main hormone during this phase is estrogen, specifically estradiol. This hormone increases by the upregulation of the follicle stimulating hormone receptors within the follicle at the beginning of the cycle. The purpose of this phase is to grow the endometrial layer of the uterus, and during this phase, a primordial follicle begins to mature into a graphene follicle. The surrounding follicles start to degenerate, which is when the graphene follicle becomes to mature, uh, becomes to, to be the major follicle. This sets up the follicle for ovulation, which is the next step. Ovulation always occurs 14 days before menses. At the end of the proliferative phase, estradiol levels are high due to the follicle maturation. And during this time, only estradiol provides positive feedback for follicle stimulating hormone and uh, luteinizing hormone production. The high levels of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone present during this time is called the LH surge. As a result, the major follicle breaks and an oocyte is released. The second phase of the menstrual cycle is the luteal or secretory phase. This phase always occurs from day 14 to day 28 of the cycle. During this phase, progesterone simulated by a luteinizing hormone is the dominant hormone to prepare the corpus luteum and the endometrium for possi uh, possible fertilized ovum implantation. As the luteal phase ends, progesterone will provide negative feedback to the anterior pituitary to decrease uh, follicle stimulating hormone and LH levels. 
Subsequently, estradiol and progesterone levels will decline. So as you realize, uh, while all the hormones have an up and down trend during the menstrual cycle, anti-Mullerian hormone seems to be more stable with less fluctuation trend. The anti-Mullerian hormone, which is also called as a Mullerian inhibiting factor or Mullerian inhibiting substance, plays a significant role in sexual differentiation. It is produced by the Sertoli cells in male fetuses and signals the Mullerian ducts regression. Wolfson ducts in males develop into the vas deferens, epididymis, and seminal vesicles. Uh, in the early development of the female fetus, the absence of AMH allows the Mullerian ducts to further develop into the fallopian tubes, uterus, and upper part of the vagina, resulting in the internal uh, female anatomy. Anti-Mullerian hormone levels is high at birth in uh, males persisting at an elevated uh, level postnatally until puberty, as you see on the uh, right hand of the slide. However, on the onset of puberty, there is a decrease in uh, anti-Mullerian hormone levels. In females, AMH levels rise through infancy and increase at puberty before remaining relatively stable until the third decade of the life. Women are born with a limited number of follicles, which are called primordial follicles, and uh, have the potential to develop mature eggs. Many follicles are recruited during the menstrual cycle. Some grow, but only one, the dominant follicle, is chosen to ovulate. The remainder of follicles is lost. This process continues until menopause, uh, when the number of remaining follicles is too small to support menstruation. The total number of follicles at any point in woman's life is referred to as ovarian reserve. In the ovary, anti-Mullerian hormone is expressed by granulosa cells of growing follicles from the primary up to the small antral uh, stage. Since Anti-Mullerian hormone is expressed by growing follicles prior to FSH-dependent selection and has been shown to be detectable in circulation. Serum anti-Mullerian hormone has taken momentum as a marker for ovarian function, particularly in assessing the quantitative aspect of the ovarian reserve. By definition, the ovarian reserve is constituted by the quality and quantity of the primordial follicles, which both decline with increasing age. The number of growing follicles reflect the number of primordial follicle pool. And since no serum marker directly can measure the number of primordial follicles, a marker that reflects the number of growing follicles is currently the best proxy for the quantitative aspect of the ovarian reserve. Initial studies performed nearly two decades ago uh, showed that serum anti-Mullerian hormone levels strongly correlate with the number of growing follicles. Based uh, on these initial studies, serum AMH was rapidly put forward as an indirect marker for ovarian reserve. Now let's have a look on the anti-Mullerian hormone testing in fertility clinics. Infertility affects millions of people of reproductive age worldwide and impacts their families and communities. Estimates suggest that between 48 million couples and 186 million individuals live with infertility globally. But how to work upon infertility? Infertility may be due to issues with the male, female, or both partners. A complete physical examination should be performed for both the male and the female. A comprehensive medical history, including items relevant to the potential etiologies of infertility, should be obtained from the patient and the partner. Also, the duration of, of infertility and results of any previous evaluation and treatment should
should be evaluated. Additional evaluations for the etiology of infertility include hormone testing, such as uh, performing luteinizing hormone, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, and other hormones. Ultrasound is an imaging test that may be performed to evaluate the ovarian volume. Uh, and of course, the antral follicle count. Hysterocytingography or laparoscopy or pelvic ultrasounds may be used to evaluate also the uterus and the fallopian tubes in females. In the male, additionally, semen is analyzed for quantity, quality, color, the, and the uh, presence of infections or blood. Today, one of the leading causes of infertility in women is the diminished ovarian reserve. Antimalarian hormone and antral follicle count are two potential ovarian reserve markers. This literature review demonstrated that anti, uh, antral follicle count and uh, antimalarian hormone to be the most sensitive markers of ovarian reserve. They are ideal in planning personalized controlled ovarian stimulation protocols. These sensitive markers permit the whole spectrum of ovarian response prediction with reliable accuracy, and clinicians may use either of the two markers. Following the categorization of expected ovarian response to stimulation, clinicians can adopt tailored therapeutic strategies for each patient. The current scientific trends suggest the elective use of the gonadotrophin-releasing hormone antagonist-based regimen for hyperresponders and probably for poor responders as uh, likely to be beneficial. The selection of the appropriate and individualized gonadotrophin dose is also of paramount importance for effective controlled ovarian stimulation and subsequent uh, in vitro fertilization outcomes. Personalized in vitro fertilization offers several benefits. It enables cl uh, clinicians to give women more accurate information on their prognosis, thus facilitating counseling, uh, especially in cases of extremes of ovarian response, for example. Also, the deployment of therapeutic strategies based on the selective use of uh, gonadotropin uh, releasing analogs and uh, the fine tuning of the gonadotropin dose based on the potential ovarian response in every woman can allow for a safer and more effective in vitro fertilization practice. And now uh, I would like to talk about some recent clinical evidences related to antimullerian hormone. This is the study of Dr. Baker that evaluated the antimullerian hormone for the prediction of antral follicle count and poor ovarian response to controlled ovarian stimulation. It is a multicenter prospective cross-sectional study that was conducted at 13 fertility centers in the United States. The primary objective of this present study was to evaluate the access AMH assay for predicting poor ovarian response to control, of course, the ovarian stimulation, which is defined as uh, four or fewer oocytes retrieved. Also, the study was designed to determine the access AMH cutoff point for predicting uh, antral follicle count that was greater than 15. Antral follicle count greater than 15 is within the range for prediction of increased risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. 237 uh, subject, subjects were enrolled in the study. Uh, a total of 178 women uh, undergoing their first in vitro fertilization cycle were eligible for the study. Uh, there was data available for, uh, from 160 women for prediction of poor ovarian response and data from 164 women for uh, antimullerian hormone correlation with antral follicle count. The mean age of the participants, it was about 35 years, and the mean uh, body mass index, it was about 25. There were few smokers in this study. 
the most common indicators for in vitro fertil uh, fertilization were the male factor, which was about 29%, idiopathic uh, infertility, 25%, and diminished ovarian reserve that was found to be 22%. If we have a look at the results uh, for patients with untried follicle count greater than 15, the mean anti-mullerian hormone was uh, level, it was 4.63 nanogram per milliliter compared with 1.70 nanogram per milliliter for patients with untried follicle count that was equal or less than 15. The, uh, the anti-mullerian hormone cutoff at 90% uh, sensitivity and 59% uh, specific specificity for uh, AFC greater than 15 was 1.75 nanogram per milliliter. To predict antral follicle count greater than 15, ROC analyzes, as shown in the, uh, in the right hand of the slide, uh, showed that uh, Anti-Mullerian hormone area under curve, it was 0 0.864, which is statistically greater than uh, FSH area under curve. For uh, poor ovarian response prediction, rock analysis showed that anti-Mullerian hormone area under curve was significantly better than antral follicle count and follicle stimulating hormone. In the multivariable logistic regression model, anti-mullerian hormone was the only independent predictor of poor ovarian response, demonstrating that a high anti-mullerian hormone level is associated with a low odds for poor ovarian response. So in conclusion, these results provide further evidence demonstrating that anti-mullerian hormone can be a valuable biomarker for predicting uh, poor ovarian response in uh, in vitro fertilization cycles, and that uh, anti-mullerian hormone is a better predictor of poor ovarian response than uh, antral follicle count or follicle stimulating hormone. Anti-mullerian hormone was highly correlated with the uh, antral follicle count. AMH cutoff was found to be 1.75 nanogram per milliliter to discriminate uh, AFC equal or less than 15 and uh, AFC that was greater than 15. An international, but still an international reference standard for AMH is urgently needed uh, to allow greater comparab comparability between assays and between laboratories. The growth of anti-mullerian hormone testing has been due to the fact that infertility is a significant health care uh, concern worldwide. Anti-mullerian hormone testing is a valuable tool in assessing ovarian reserve in women with infertility issues. But as researchers progress, the use of anti-mullerian hormone testing could go beyond fertility assessment to, uh, to evaluate uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, reproductive age, uh, or cancer such as granulosa cell tumors. Uh, anti-mullerian hormone levels are a matter of research also in pediatric studies regarding sexual differentiation and maturation. As I mentioned in my previous slides, anti-mullerian hormone concentration is high at birth in males. It demonstrates the, pre it demonstrates the presence of uh, a functional testicular tissue in the prepubertal period and acts as a helpful marker in investigating pediatric uh, reproductive disorders. Anti-mullerian hormone also provides a tool in investigating female virilization premature ovarian failure and polycystic ovarian syndrome in childhood. While uh, AMH measurement may be helpful in the evaluation of, the, uh, of an infant with a suspected disorder of sexual development, uh, age-specific reference intervals are required to interpret results. 
This study of Dr. Joplin was about deriving age specific AMH reference intervals for males and females aged 0 to 18 years. The objective of the study was to improve the clinical utility of plasma anti hormone measurement by determining robust uh, reference intervals for males and females across the pediatric age range. Plasma levels were obtained from patients at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. 702 samples were collected in this study. 465 uh, samples were from male and uh, 237 uh, samples were from female. As a result, statistically significant differences were observed between anti hormone concentration of male and female plasma samples across uh, the age range. In males, AMH was high at birth and remained elevated throughout infancy finally decreasing around 12 years of age. Conversely, AMH was relatively low in females following birth and gradually increasing during infancy and childhood. To account for the spread of uh, data across the age ranges and to consider as a continuous data set, two different uh, quantile regression models were built, uh, one for each gender, as you see on the right hand of the slide. As expected, the male trend demonstrated a high concentration of antimullerian hormone at birth, increasing to a peak within the first year of life, before decreasing and plateauing during the um, infancy and decreasing further at puberty. Antimullerian hormone in females started low at birth, increasing to a peak in infancy, with a slight decrease before again increasing as participants entered puberty shortly before 10 years of age. In this study, it was hypothesized that different testosterone concentrations due to entering puberty at different ages might account for some of the observed variations in uh, the AMH concentration of different age groups. So all male samples were analyzed for testosterone and the correlation of testosterone with antimullerian hormone concentration was considered. In general, high levels of testosterone found predominantly in age groups uh, 10 and 11 were associated with low concentrations of AMH. Conversely, high concentrations of AMH were, were associated with low concentrations of testosterone during infancy in age groups seven and nine. AMH and testosterone were both raised in several neonatal samples in age groups one to six. So in conclusion, clear discrimination between male and female anti-mullerian hormone results was evident in the prepubertal age range with some overlap between the genders following pubertal onset. The anti-mullerian hormone reference intervals will aid in the investigation of pediatric endocrine disorders. An AMH concentration falling with the, within the male pediatric uh, reference interval is therefore uh, highly indicative of the, of the presence of functioning testicular tissue. But a female presenting with an AMH level within the male reference interval should be examined for uh, both the presence of testis or the presence of a granulosa cell tumor. Then why health care professionals should choose access AMHSA? Beckman culture uh, has been involved with AMH uh, from the early days. It is the first company to market an AMH ELISA, pro ELISA product. Also, it is the first, co first company to globally market an automated AMH assay. From the launch of the first commercial assay, the volume of anti-mullerian hormone testing has increased uh, due to a large number of the publication and studies, such as more than uh, 3,000. 
The intended use of uh, access AMHSA is the uh, quantitative determination of anti-Mullerian hormone levels in human serum and plasma as an aid in the assessment of ovarian reserve. But what is the difference between access AMH, AMHSA and other uh, tests? Access AMH is the only automated AMH immunoassay to use a recombinant human antigen. It provides greater immunological recognition of anti-Mullerian hormone antibodies. On the other hand, a bovine antigen is harvested from a cow. Every harvest may produce slightly different antigens, which could change how their calibrators see human anti-Mullerian hormone. So it is possible to have different dose response relationships between human anti-Mullerian hormone and bovine calibrator. We can say that human recombinant anti-Mullerian uh, hormone is the preferred material by the uh, National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. Another difference uh, of access AMHSA to other assays is that Access AMHSA uses a synthetic matrix that is entirely free of endogenous anti-Mullerian hormone activity, simulates analyte-free uh, human serum, and ensures excellent lot-to-lot -lot stability and reproducibility. Equine serum matrix could contain uh, immune-reactive fragments partially reactive with assay antibodies. So it may introduce variable batch-to-batch -batch background and impair assay sensitivity. Access AMH deliver patients results in 40 minutes through fast automated testing. It establishes robust analytical performance that is not subject to biotin or complement interference demonstrate excellent short-term and long-term sample AMH stability, correlate better with low antral follicle counts, and also excess AMH reduce laboratory costs by 16% over uh, typical manual tests uh, while minimizing, of course, operator variability. Beckman Culture provides a full line of reproductive assays to meet healthcare professionals' needs, all assays within the access uh, reproductive menu can be run on any access immunoassay uh, analyzer, providing the same quality and reliabil uh, reliability of methods and tests results. Before uh, closing my presentation, I would like to summarize that anti-Mullerian hormone is an indirect measurement of ovarian reserve which reflects the number of follicles that have the potential to grow. Anti-Mullerian hormone helps clinicians assess women's ovarian reserve in the decision-making process to achieve optimal number of eggs. Also, Access AMHSA has the state-of-the-art uh, assay design to, to provide consistent and uh, reliable anti-Mullerian hormone results that are available on automated analyzers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for Dr. Thank you, Dr. Matilda. And now is the time for question. Um, please feel free if you have any question to post it on the Q and A session on the right side of screen. Okay, so um, Dr. Matilda, we do have one question here. Um, what is the stability of the calibrators and controls? And I could answer here um, this question. So the stability of the um, calibrator and control for the assay is 31 days. Yeah, yeah. Mm. 
Sure, Ahmed, me too. I would like to, to, to answer the question. It is possible to say that access AMHSA is more stable than, than other tests. The uh, reconstituted calibrators are stable for 90 days at uh, 2 to 10 degree, uh, degrees Celsius, and the curve is stored for uh, 31 days. And the quality control, re, uh, reconstituted controls, are stable for two days when stored at uh, 2 to 10 degrees Celsius. And uh, also they are stable for 60 days when stored frozen at uh, minus 15 to minus 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, quality controls can be sold, but not more than three times. Thank you very much, Dr. Matilda. And the other question, is there a lot-to-lot -lot variation of axis AMH? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, there is a study that evaluated lot-to-lot -lot variation uh, of access AMH. Uh, 20 samples uh, were run uh, in this study, and uh, a perfect correlation was found, uh, such as one. Uh, so we may say that uh, access AMH is not shifting for, uh, from the calibration. Thank you, Dr. Matilda. Uh, what is the relation between AMH and testosterone in the pediatric population? Uh, actually, there is a negative correlation between testosterone and uh, anti-mullerian hormone levels. At birth, the levels of uh, AMH are high at means and decline until puberty. Uh, controversially, testosterone levels show an increase throughout infancy. Uh, so, uh, we may expect that uh, to have low AMH levels and high testosterone levels uh, at the same time or controversially. But what was unexpected is that uh, it is possible to see high levels of both testosterone and anti-mullerian hormone at males up to one year. Uh, this is thought to be because uh, that uh, there, there is the lack of expression uh, of the androgen receptors in Sertoli cells during the neonatal age. Thank you very much. And the last question, during the menstrual cycle, which day AMH should be measured to get the best result for predicting the ovarian reserve? Mm. Uh, during menstrual cycles, uh, uh, as I showed in my previous slides, uh, most of the hormones such as estradiol, progesterone, uh, follicle stimulating hormone, they show great variability day to day. But anti-mullerian hormone concentration also it decreases uh, with age. Uh, studies have shown that the day-to-day -day variability of uh, anti-mullerian hormone concentrations in menstruating women is very low, without clinical significance. So it is possible to measure anti-mullerian hormone levels at any day during the menstrual cycle. Okay, that was clear. Thank you very much, Dr. Matilda, for answering all the questions. And before closing the session, do we have any other questions from the attendees? please feel free to post it on the Q&A session on the right side of the screen. Um, yes, we got another question here. Can we consider that all IVF centers are familiar with AMH diagnosis utility? Uh, well, th this is really a tricky question. Uh, Actually, there are a lot of studies that um, are uh, that uh, IV centers are, are considering uh, AMH diagnosis. But uh, uh, to be honest, if all of these centers can consider AMH testing, for sure we don't know it. Thank you. So I think the session made it um, clear about the clinical utilities of the assay. So um, do we have any other question here in the Q&A? Please feel free to post it. So I think there is no more questions posted here in the Q&A. 
So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Matilda, for this very informative webinar, and also thank our uh, valued customer and business partner who attended this session. And um, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any question after this webinar. You will have our email addresses to the invitation, and please do not forget to uh, fill the short survey. Thank you very much, Dr. Matilda. Thank you. Thank you.